Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment webinar on a fascinating book, which we're going to discuss with Mervyn King and John Kay. Uh, the book is entitled Radical Uncertainty, Decision-Making for an Unknowable Future. I'm Michael Minelli. I am a chartered uh, fellow at the Securities uh, CISI, and I would like to say welcome. Welcome to my bedroom, uh, which is now turned into a recording studio in these days of coronavirus. Now, both of the authors have very distinguished careers and you can read about them online. I've long admired and enjoyed John's company, in particular, uh, his thinking on long-term uh, finance and economics. And of course, Mervyn King uh, needs no introduction, although I did rather like the Baron King of Lothbury, which is absolutely perfect. Uh, Lothbury, of course, is where my office is located and I happen to be alderman for Broad Street Ward, so it's nice to have a baron and a king there at the same time. Uh, but Mervyn served for 10 years from 2003 to 2013 uh, as governor of the Bank of England. And the two of them have teamed up in a magnum opus, really, which has been, I understand, nearly a 10-year, decade-long project, and we'll let them speak about that in a moment. One of the more interesting uh, reviews uh, on Amazon uh, was uh, for a hyper-discursive one-idea book. This was actually rather good, uh, and I think that's quite a bit of praise. Uh, we're going to uh, talk to the authors for about 30, 35 minutes, uh, and you do have the ability uh, to suggest questions that I will put to them uh, rather than sort of an open format, uh, but please do feel free to put questions and also to comment in the chat room if that appeals to you. Uh, we uh, look forward to, uh, to a bit more engagement, but let's let the authors put their case first. Now, uh, Mervyn and John, uh, I, I think this is probably directed probably more to you, John, to start with. Uh, history in this case, you make a remark that uh, the distinction between uncertainty and risk and probability uh, that we make in daily life is actually a, a fairly new construct. Your book uh, goes back to some lovely quotes. I loved one where you were talking about uh, Polybius and Livy. The account of Livy has more of probability, yet that of Polybius has more of truth, stressing the idea that Livy is very strong on narrative stories that fit together, whereas Polybius was trying to emphasize uh, material advice. What was this change, though, that happened about 500 years ago? And what, are, what did it portend for today? The change essentially was that until the 17th century, people didn't have a concept of chance or probability, that they knew that the world was uncertain, uh, but it was determined effectively by the will of the gods. And that's why they did things that seemed to us very strange, like reading the entrails and consulting the Oracle of Delphi and so on. And it wasn't until the 17th century when there was a French gambler called the Chevalier de Meur, who asked for some advice on how to manage gambling to better. And he consulted two very distinguished French polymaths of the era, uh, Fermat and Pascal. And they came up with the mathematics of probability. And that has been, um, and that has been part of our thinking ever since. What's really surprising in this is the Greeks were very good at mathematics, to put it mildly. They gambled, but they never thought of approaching it in this kind of way. Hmm. What I find interesting is that, as John said, the concept of probability came out of looking at a practical problem, playing cards or dice, gambling. And if you look at the textbooks on statistics today, very often the applications and the examples given are exactly the same uh, same phenomena. That is, tossing a coin, drawing different colored balls out of an urn and working out what chance there is for a particular colored ball to emerge. These are all very narrow, well-defined problems where we have experience that you can use to judge the frequency or probability of a coin toss or pulling out a particular colored ball from the urn. But none of this corresponds to actual decisions that we face, particularly in business and finance, where many of the decisions are unique decisions. We, we haven't done them hundreds of times before. Mm. And that's fundamental to the way we're thinking, because part, perhaps 
part of the reason why people find probability difficult is that probability isn't actually all that useful. The number of situations in which it helps get you, you get answers is quite limited. Now, your book makes a, quite a bit of a play on the, the many, many problems uh, that models uh, create, in, in, in a sense, and, and how we abuse them. But to, perhaps before we get going, could you just give uh, the, the audience a good description, definition, if I might ask, of radical uncertainty? Because that is the core focus of the book. And I think it's important that the audience grasps the, the point you're really trying to make here. What is radical uncertainty? Uncertainty of any kind arises because we have imperfect information. Now, there's quite a lot of uncertainty that you can resolve by looking it up, by finding out information. That's a resolvable uncertainty. And uncertainty is also resolvable if, as at the gambling table, uh, you can define it by specifying a probability distribution. So you don't know what's going to happen, but you know the things that will happen, and you know, can work out the probabilities uh, that they will have. Radical uncertainty is the rest, which is actually most of the world. And that's typ the typical problem we face in decision making, which is where the problem isn't terribly well defined. And we often may not be sure what the answer was, even after events have transpired. In the, in the case of a radical uncertainty, I mean, we've had a, a lot over the last 15 years from uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb and his black swans. What is similar or dissimilar between what you're trying to get across? Well, a black swan is a special case of our definition of radical uncertainty. It's, it's where you cannot imagine events that then occur at all. So when the settlers went to Australia, they couldn't imagine that swans might be black. They just knew that sw all swans were white. They wouldn't have bet on the ship that they would discover a black swan. The concept was inconceivable. That's a true black swan. But radical uncertainty is something very different. It's where it goes way beyond that. It's where you can't quantify the chances. So if you take the current virus as an example, we knew that pandemics were possible. Indeed, in the book on page 40, we say that we should expect to be hit by an epidemic of an infectious disease caused by a virus that does not yet exist. So we knew that the concept of epidemics was there and it was likely to come, but that in no way would it have made sense to say, what's the probability that the virus will hit China or go to the UK at a certain date in 2019 or 2020? You couldn't quantify that uncertainty. And the attempt to attach numbers to probabilities for those events confuses the issue rather than helps us understand what's going on. So it's any uncertainty that can't be quantified. It goes way beyond the black swans. That's a, a, an extreme and special case. But do you not think that people uh, put some type of uh, probability implicitly on a lot of these cases? So uh, you talk about uh, asteroids and that neither of you have decided to take precautions against asteroids, but is it uh, not true that to some degree you've assigned some type of at least rank order of where asteroids are in the scheme of things you're going to bother about? Yes. No, I think that uh, in when we decide not to worry about asteroids, but maybe governments decide to talk to each other and put in place some mechanism to discover an early warning system of asteroids, they don't think about the probability that it will occur in a quantitative sense. Okay. They may ask themselves whether it's likely or not, but that's a very different issue. And there's an important distinction here between likelihood and probability, although these words are very often elided in everyday usage. Um, to take an example, what is the capital of the state of Pennsylvania? Some people in this audience will know, some people uh, will, will not. Is it Philadelphia or not? Well, if I apply the general rule that says the capital of a state is usually its largest city, I will say it's likely that it's Philadelphia. To ask what is the probability that it's Philadelphia is ludicrous. And of course, you can go and look it up and you will discover it's not Philadelphia. There's a distinction here between what is likely 
by virtue of my general knowledge of the world and being able to attach a probability to something. You, you quote Churchill on a number of occasions, and one of my favorite Churchill quotes is, I cannot forecast to you the action of Russia. It is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Uh, and he goes on to say that, that the key uh, is uh, Russian national interest. And so Churchill is talking in many ways about the narrative being far more important than uh, some of the stuff in there. But you do go on um, on a couple of occasions uh, to, I think, really quite insightfully point out that where economists uh, haven't necessarily been producing models, but where they've been taking what is a mystery <clears throat> and uh, moving it into more of a puzzle domain so we can get our teeth onto it. For example, uh, your emphasis on the prisoner's <laughs> dilemma. Do you, would you be able just to explain kind of the distinction between a mystery and a puzzle to the audience? Okay, a, a mystery, a puzzle is a well-defined problem where there's an objectively correct answer. It may be very difficult to find out what it is with complicated crossword puzzles or something, uh, but there's an answer and you know when you've reached it. And when you've reached it, everyone agrees that that was the right answer. A mystery typically isn't like that. As we were describing earlier, a mystery is something where the problem isn't very well defined and you may not know what the answer is even after it's happened. To give an example, there's a guy, uh, some, some of your listeners will know the work of Philip Tetlock, who's devised something called a Good Judgment Project. It made the news a few weeks ago when Boris Johnson hired someone with that background, a super forecaster, as Tetlock calls him, and then decided he didn't need him after all. What the super forecasters are asked to do is they're asked questions like, you know, one opening, one open question at the moment is, will the Donetsk region of Ukraine be given a special legal status by the end of July uh, 2020? Now that's a well-defined question, and in August will I know the answer to that one way or another. But it's not really what people want to know. They want to know what's going to happen in Ukraine. What are the Russians going to do? Is it going to settle down or is it going to clear up again? That's a much vaguer question, and even next year we won't necessarily know the answer. So in a sense then, um, a puzzle is more similar to risk and a mystery is more what you're talking about here in terms of radical uncertainty would that be fair uh, well, we can but, come back to what risk is in a minute i think okay. that's a because we have a, a, a rather new definition of risk but mm -hmm. the distinction between risk and uncertainty really came out of discussions in the 1920s when frank knight uh, wrote a book with the words risk and uncertainty in the title and he wanted to distinguish between the two but I think what reinforces what John said before about the meaningless of using probabilities is vividly illustrated by the fact that in the 1920s, uh, Frank Ramsey, who was the person who really promoted the idea of subjective probabilities, reflecting our inner feelings, and Bertrand Russell and Wittgenstein and others were debating the meanings of truth and probability. But what's revealing is that on no occasion do they ever, they, they would often say it is likely that Wittgenstein is right, or it is likely that Ramsey is right. But on no occasion did any of them dream of saying, I think the probability that Wittgenstein is right is 0.3, or that Ramsey is right is 0.6. They didn't think themselves in those terms because the words, you know, this was a mystery. These were concepts that were difficult to grapple with, and you couldn't pretend that they could resolve by putting artificial numbers on them. Mm. Now, back in the 1920s, uh, people attached importance, Keynes and Knight in particular, to distinction between risk and uncertainty. And in their definition, risk was something you could uh, describe probabilistically, and uncertainty was something you couldn't. Uh, now that distinction, as everyone listening to this uh, will know, became elided after the Second World War. And as people in financial markets observe, the world's risk and uncertainty are treated as meaning pretty much the same thing and are equated with volatility. And we think that's actually very seriously misleading. 
that risk and uncertainty are different and neither of them is actually the same as volatility. Well, one of the uh, people listening in has made, I think, a good point here. Okay, we, we want to reestablish that distinction that's been elided, but what quantifies as radical? Well, I think the concept that we do not find probabilities useful in discussing most of the issues that we want to study people making businesses, deciding about investment, all the range of issues that economics discusses uh, tend to take the view that it is sensible to assume that individuals and businesses have well-defined probabilities defined over all possible future outcomes. And I think it's a radical idea to suggest that that is a very misleading approach. Mm -hmm. It applies only to what the great statistician in the 50s, Jimmy Savage in Chicago, called a small world. Mm -hmm. And yet people were so enamored by the idea of thinking that they could quantify and so tame uncertainty. I think they wanted to do it because they felt our subject can explain all behavior yeah. If only we can get rid of this dreadful phenomenon that individuals do not quite manage easily to cope with an uncertain future. So let's make it a lot easier for them by pretending that they've all got probabilities. And so the economic model captures everything that you need to know. And I think that turns out to be very misleading. And I could see that when I was at the bank in terms of the value of predictions and then something wholly unexpected happening like the financial crisis. Back, back in the 17th century, uh, probability was used as we described for um, talking about games of chance. And the first extension of it was actually to human mortality. And actually there's a man called John Grant who went through the cemeteries of the city of London. A haberdasher, yes. The ages of, of people who died. So that was the first basis of the first mortality tables. And then you could uh, extend that for other things within in the insurance industry. So that, for example, we have pretty good probabilistic data in relation to, say, the incidence of motor accidents mm. uh, and things like that. Now, what we're talking about here are where we have some kind of stationary process and we have repeated trials. Mm -hmm. People drive every day. Some of them drive badly. Uh, and... Uh, every day we get a new experiment in terms of how many people have accidents. We can just about it, send it to the weather. So if you look at your smartphone, it will say there's a 40% chance it will rain tomorrow. That's about stretching the limits of what we can do probabilistically. Mm. And what we can't do it for is the one-off events uh, that uh, Mervyn was talking about earlier, nor we can, can we do it for the other class of events that Mervyn was talking about earlier were um, which is failures in terms of um, financial instruments and, books and risk management there where you are dealing with unique events and where historic data series don't actually give you much information about the future. Well, this might be a good time then uh, to turn Mervyn you said you you'd like to convey a new definition of risk. So in financial circles, risk and volatility have tended to be regarded as the same thing. And you will see in newspapers, people talking about the VIX index. Measures of volatility are thought to capture what is meant by, by risk. We don't think that's a very helpful approach. Uh, risk is not volatility. It, risk in most people's understanding is always something bad. Volatility is movements on both the up and the downside. So what we propose is thinking about it in a rather different way in which we say that people have expectations, realistic expectations as to how their life will develop. Uh, people don't say there's a risk I might win the national lottery. That's not a realistic view. Nor do they actually say there's a risk I might not win the national lottery because that's not something they contemplate. What they do have is a view as to how their life may unfold over the next few months. And they judge risks as a bad outcome relative to that, something that could upset that narrative, which is a realistic view of what they can hope to, to aspire to. 
And that I think is a more helpful way to think about what really constitutes risk. And it has one very important implication, which is that method of thinking of risk is specific to the individual family or business that we are talking about. It is not something that's a property of market variables. It's a, something which is characteristic of the, of the individual. And we should think about it in, in those terms. Mm. And doing that enables us to liberate the concept of uncertainty out of the purely narrow view of risk, which is where something bad happens to you, to a world in which many aspects of uncertainty are highly desirable. Mm -hmm. I like saying to graduates when they uh, qualify for their degrees that they all say to me beforehand, oh, I'm very worried, my future is very uncertain. And then I say to them, if I could tell you today, here's a list of the six people who could be your life partners and the probability of each of them, and here are the three jobs you might do and the probabilities, they would be utterly depressed because what they want is something exciting to happen, something new. And we all want that, whether it's meeting people, whether it's discovering new music, new books, new places to visit, and which whether as Frank Knight wrote, an entrepreneur discovers a new product, a new business, a new process, which no one had thought of before. And that is exciting. And that's what generates progress in our societies. So the good things about our, the way our societies and economies develop come out of uncertainty. So many aspects of uncertainty are very good and positive. Risk we think of as something that is not good. And we want to try and find ways to help people minimize the risks that they're taking. A lot of people will have seen the film Groundhog Day, in which Bill Murray is compelled to live the same day over and over again. So he knows exactly what's going to happen. And it's not fun. It's terrible. It's so bad that in the end, he tries to commit suicide. But he can't even do that because that's in the script that's written for it. That's what Mervyn and I mean by saying that uncertainty, so long as you manage risk, uncertainty is something to welcome. So there's pleasant certainty and unpleasant certainty and risk. And that's one of the great things about the book and reading it is your ability to tease apart some of these conflations that people have made between, as you indicated, Mervyn, uh, risk and volatility or risk and uncertainty. Now, in, in the book, um, and, I, and I happen to think very quite rightly, uh, Donald Rumsfeld has taken a lot of flack, but you you actually think he's making some extremely good points there, don't you? Well, we, we, we use his expression about known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns as a way of introducing to people who've probably heard that some of the ideas and concepts that we want to develop. But uh, he wasn't <coughs> actually the first person to use that expression, though most people seem to have assumed it was. It actually goes back to uh, Boeing engineers in the 1950s who got a very lucky break through the tragedy of the Comet airplanes crashing. And people didn't at first understand why they had crashed. And only after the second accident and a very intensive investigation did people discover that the very beautiful square windows in the Comet airplanes were creating metal fatigue that emanated from the corners of those square windows. And that's why every airplane you see now has oval shaped windows. And these were the unknown unknowns that inspired the Boeing engineers to develop a different shape of the window. And Boeing benefited enormously from that and the rest is history. So uh, you know, I think Donald Rumsfeld, whether he fully understood the implications of the uh, examples that he gave at his press conference when he mentioned that i don't know um but it's th the idea that there are things that can happen that we can't easily imagine beforehand and even if we can have some vague glimpse of what they might look like we certainly can't quantify them and of course much of the work <laughs> in finance in recent years has been to pretend that we can tame uncertainty by quantifying risk in such a way that we can then price it exactly. And by pricing it, we can then just give it to the market to share around allegedly to those people best able to bear it. But risk isn't actually 
like that. And I think the coronavirus is rather a good example of how we are not able to tame risk by pricing it. This wasn't part of people's plan and they certainly hadn't priced it. I'd like to come back to Corona in a minute. Um, and I, I must say as well, one of the things for me on, on Rumsfeld is he paints out uh, three squares in a quadrant, but he leaves off uh, talking about unknown knowns, which is to me an interesting one, you know, particularly in a corporate setting where uh, I often have skills I don't know anything about. Uh, and I think coronavirus is an interesting case there where people have not been using the video conferencing facilities that they've installed or haven't used corporately something that is actually installed on everyone's machine, whether it's Zoom or Skype or Jitsi or what have you. Uh, and suddenly they're contrasted doing So they had sort of an unknown known as well. But um, uh, one of the other things you touch on in the book, and, and equally in fact, coming from um, the US, uh, like Boeing with its unknown unknowns, uh, was actually uh, Horst and Rittel and others who came up with the idea of wicked problems. So how much is radical uncertainty uh, related or associated with wicked problems, these aggressive circular problems that you don't even know where to start. I and mean, one of the striking things here, uh, when we talked earlier about puzzles and mysteries, things where you could define, uh, define the problem and know what the answer was and where you couldn't, was how on almost every practical subject, this distinction became important. The context of the wicked, wicked and tame problems began with urban planners talking about the, uh, the problems with the feedback they got uh, when, they, when they built new communities. It was then now quite widely used in medicine where people talk about tame problems and wicked problems. If you go to engineering, engineers distinguish between what they call epistemic and aleatory uncertainty. Almost every practical discipline like medicine or engineering or planning has this distinction between uh, mysteries and puzzles, between the kind of uncertainties that you can handle with probability distributions and the ones you can't. And that makes finance rather striking because we've tried in finance to elide that distinction. One of our viewers has said something, I, I think summarizing this quite well, it's uh, from Manav Gadia. Would it be right to say that a puzzle has a probability to result in a fixed number of ways, while a mystery will depend on future courses of actions and circumstances for its probability of results to reduce? Not a bad take, I think. Um, well, uh, we, we could go on about uh, some of these definitional issues. Uh, for some time, but obviously what we're, we're interested in uh, as practical people is how do we apply this? Um, so you touched on uh, coronavirus. Um, what would a radical uncertainty view of the world say uh, over the last two decades uh, done to help change the decisions that we may or may not be making on coronavirus or COVID-19? Well, I think there's a, a common link here between the coronavirus challenge and the financial crisis of a decade ago. In both cases, we knew that banking crises or pandemics were possible, indeed likely. And we say that on page 40 of our book. Mm -hmm. But in neither case did that knowledge give you any reason for saying the probability that there would be a financial crisis in October 2008 or a pandemic emanating from China in December 2019. You couldn't attach a probability to it. There was no basis for doing that. So what do you learn from this general knowledge? Well, what you learn is that if there are systems which are critical to the operation of the economy or society as a whole, which in 2008 we said was true of banking, which is why the banking system was bailed out, and if we think the health system is critical to coping with something unexpected like the coronavirus, then what you focus on are qualities like resilience and robustness. The big mistake that was made before the financial crisis was to allow the banking system to run at the lowest possible safety margin. Its holdings of liquid assets were run down almost to nothing. The capital, buffer, <coughs> excuse me, the capital buffers that banks had to absorb losses were run right down relative to 40 or 50 years ago. 
And the result was that the banking system was very fragile. And when something unexpected happened, it couldn't cope and it had to be supported by the government. Equally, with our health systems now, we need to focus, and I'm sure once the post-mortem is carried out on this epidemic, that we will realize the need to have much greater ability to build resilience into our health systems. And we will ask questions, you know, do we need the equivalent of a territorial army for the health service, where people get trained for a week a year and they're on the reserves to be called into action when needed? How quickly can we construct hospitals and intensive care beds? I think it's been a remarkable achievement to construct the Nightingale hospitals. But there will be issues about in future about, you know, should we invest more in research that might shorten the length of time in which a vaccine could be developed without knowing in advance what the virus is against which we will need the vaccine. But the key principle here is that just running things on the basis of profit maximizing behavior trying to be as efficient as possible in normal circumstances omits a very important ingredient, which is survival. And robustness and resilience are the key to tackling that. And it won't just be true of banking systems and health systems. Every individual company, I think, will ask themselves questions. Is my business resilient to some unexpected shock? And just relying on a single source of just-in-time supply is not necessarily a good response to that. So many things will happen in the future, but I think the whole point about the discussion of radical uncertainty is that it, it doesn't pretend that you can sort of ignore uncertainty by saying everything's priced, all we have to do is to maximize profits given the prices of things out there in the market. Yes, yeah, so Andrew McCulloch here has made a point uh, you know, similar to yours that, uh, should we assume there's always a certain probability something bad will happen and plan on that basis? Uh, and I myself have uh, long remarked that one of the issues on robustness and resilience is, you, is the tension in, with efficiency. So uh, whether it's the efficiency of the health service or the efficiency of global supply chains, or I might actually argue uh, the efficiency of credit. Uh, we've seen large systems in the world that were very, very efficient, but therefore uh, quite brittle and this brittleness is coming through. But the question in a competitive world, you know, is normally, well, I'll wait for the government to bail me out, whether I'm a bank in 2008 or nine, or I wait for the government to bail me out if I'm a small business in the UK at the moment, because, hey, it was the government that stopped it. Um, so the question then becomes, you know, who's going to pay for this resilience? No, in no, a competitive you're... world, can I, can, I, can I bear with that when, you know, I'm running for eight or nine years uh, more efficiently than you, I win all the business, uh, your resilience isn't being paid for, is it? Well, well, it's paid when you stay in business through a crisis like this. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right that I may be chief executive of a company for five years and I get all the costs of building and resilience and none of it. This is how the issues book, in a sense, tie in very fundamentally to the work on long-term decision-making. Mm -hmm. Am I trying to build a business that's going to be sustainable for 25 years, or am I trying to meet my next quarterly earnings targets? I hope that one of the lessons people will take away from this is the point Mervyn was making about the need for robustness and resilience. That means actually, uh, in engineering terms, engineers will design complex systems with what they call modularity which means if a bit shuts down, it doesn't mean the whole system come halt. Redundancy, so you build things a bit stronger than you need them to be. We've tended in the last few years to regard these things as signs of inefficiency and eliminate them. I hope that this will lead people to, to rethink that. And I, you know, the, the, if take the example of the banking system again, the Banking Commission chaired by John Vickers proposed exactly what John has just talked about. That is a degree of ring fencing to deal with a modularity problem and higher capital requirements to ensure greater resilience in that dimension. And that combination of measures makes sense. And uh, it attracted you know, a good deal of opposition from the industry. But we as taxpayers have to 
press back and say, well, you know, if we don't take these measures and put them in place into a regulatory framework, then it'll be the taxpayers who bear the burden down the road when we all admit that the system itself is very important to the functioning of the entire economy. I think this argument can be won. And I think the example of the coronavirus, exactly as John has just said, will lead people to think in a slightly different way about how we reflect on regulation in a world of uncertainty. Now, I've got an interesting question here uh, from Alicia Harrington-Clark, uh, wondering if uncertainties and risks occur concurrently or transition from one to another in your definition, or is that a, is that a false distinction? I think the answer to that is they occur concurrently. I, I once went to a meeting at the Treasury uh, between a group of con government contractors and some trade economists. And the government contractors were engaged in very large defense projects, a high proportion of which went wrong somewhere or another. And the Treasury economists had all done finance courses at good economics departments and business schools and the like. And the Treasury economist explained that the companies didn't need to be rewarded for risk. They knew about the capital asset pricing. The risks associated with these contracts were perfectly diversifiable, and therefore they didn't need to earn much above the government bond rate as return on capital. You can imagine that the people from the defense contractors looked at these people as if they were wondering what planet they had actually come from. And they are just, they're just talking about risk and uncertainty in ways that meant slight, completely different things. The defense contractors thought about risk the way we uh, think of risk. Risk is something that derails your reference narrative. You start with a picture of what you think is going to happen and you identify the risks, the things that can go wrong with that. The people who were the treasury economists on the other hand had been taught to equate risk and volatility and uncertainty. And that's not how most real problems in the real world actually pan out. Okay. So um, I, I wanted to give you both an opportunity uh, to, to just briefly, uh, in the book you uh, quite rightly talk about the evolution of economics and that uh, Homo uh, economicus is um, changed over the years and behavioral economics has been realized, et cetera. But you, you point to the uh, very strong influence of, of the Friedman Doctrine, the Chicago School, you know, the freshwater thinking in uh, economics. Do you just want to comment on uh, why you feel that that is still such a persistent area? Well, let me talk about sort of my experience in seeing this at, at the bank. Mm -hmm. It's I think we should be very clear that we're not against that kind of economics or indeed the use of models. Mm -hmm. But I think what we feel very strongly is that the models, often in their most abstract form, sometimes very highly mathematical, give us very key important insights into what goes on in, the, in an economy. So, for example, the, the rational expectations revolution in macroeconomics did help a lot of people understand that there were limits on what governments could do because they couldn't fool people all of the time, even if they could do it for part of the time. And this is an important un thing to understand if you're implementing policy. You need to work out how the private sector is going to respond to the policies that you put in place. But none of that means that you can pretend that there are simple models which are very good at predicting quantitatively what will happen. It's very different from that. The, some of the most important economic insights that I think both John and I have used in our career have come from theoretical models where they may have been examples that were used to explain what it might mean in practice, but it was the insight that we took away from the model that we could apply ourselves when confronted with a completely new situation. You know, the efficient markets hypothesis tells you that if you've got an idea about an investment you want to make, you ought to ask yourself, well, why do I think I'm the first person to have yeah. thought of this? Is this not already in the price in the market? That insight is crucially important to thinking about investment decisions. 
But it does not follow from that that the efficient markets hypothesis is a good literal description of the world. Indeed, most of the people who've made money have made it precisely because it isn't a good literal description of what happens in the world. So economics is very helpful as a way of thinking about problems. The mistake is to think that you can construct models that are actually good quantitative predictors, as opposed to giving you an insight into struggling to understand with the challenges of a one-off problem that we face. When John and I were talking about the book, and John talked about some of his experiences talking to businesses, I was very struck that almost all of the examples that John gave of the business problems he was asked to advise on were in essence a one-off problem. You know, John couldn't say, oh yes, I've seen 999 exact examples of this in the past, and this is what you should do. You have to think your way through the problem. And economics is very helpful in that respect, but it should not be seen as literally a description of the world. It's back, it, uh, it's back to that question of what does it mean when you look at your smartphone and it says there's a 40% probability that it will rain tomorrow. What, what it means is weather conditions repeat themselves pretty often and experienced meteorologists have estimated that a 40% of, of occasions on which they see conditions of this kind, it's followed by rain. Now, there are some problems that you can treat in that kind of way, but most of the large problems we actually face in business and finance are just not of that kind. Uh, and even then, as you point out in the book, the question might be a deeper one, like, should I do something about my daughter's wedding tomorrow, or should I be carrying a brawly or not? So it is yeah. raining, but I can walk through it. Now I'm taking a two hour walk, I better take a brawly, that kind of thing. It's a very exactly. different situation. Well, once you've learned that there's a percent probability it will rain tomorrow, yeah. it's not really told you what you want to know. You want to know, should, Correct. should I take an umbrella? Do I need a marquee for my daughter's wedding? Yeah. Or whatever. Well, what, what I liked is, you know, it's a, it is a, a longish book, to be frank, 544 pages, if I recall. Uh, but certainly one of the things that wasn't it, you, you took a lot of puzzles apart uh, and they were very helpful. The one I loved in particular, which shows some of the limits, was the two envelope problem. I don't know if you want to touch on that briefly. Happily describe it. Uh, you are told that you, you're shown two envelopes. Uh, you're told one of them contains twice as much money as the other. You open one of the envelopes and you discover it contains a hundred pounds. Now, do you want to switch, you're asked, do you want to take that envelope, take the hundred pounds or switch to the other one? Well, the other one you now know has either 200 pounds in it or 50 pounds in it. So most people would think you should switch because the expected value of that is 125 pounds. But that says whatever envelope you chose the first time, you'd be better off choosing the other one. And that can't be right. Now, <laughs> the serious problem, and there's a lot of serious articles in mathematical journals about what's wrong with that kind of analysis. What the frontal issue is you simply cannot describe this problem in probabilistic terms. And that may be a takeaway for people who really want to struggle back to the idea that you can talk about everything probabilistically. Yeah, I, I thought that was lovely. Well, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left and uh, I'd like to focus again, if we could, a bit on practicality. Um, and coronavirus is uh, certainly here and real, uh, but I think would lead to a lot of um, uh, well, a lot of uh, throwing around blame on you know, what could or couldn't have been done. Let's look to another problem that uh, some of the listeners have indicated they'd like you to touch upon, uh, climate change. What does your book tell us about our approaches to climate change? Well, I think one of the, for me, one of the lessons from, which I, I thought about before all this, is that there was a great deal of focus on climate change as if it were the only thing that could really go badly wrong. And what we know now is that there are many things that could go badly wrong that could derail the realistic expectations or the reference narrative that we had. And the coronavirus looks like being a very serious downside risk where all the reference narratives that we had about 
what we were going to do this summer, how the economy would develop, have turned out in a very adverse direction. So <clears throat> if you ask the question, how much should we be prepared to pay to deal with a challenge like climate change? It doesn't make sense to do that on the basis that this is the only way in which the world could come to a sticky end. There are many ways that could happen. That doesn't mean to say that climate change isn't a very serious problem and we should think hard about it. But I think what it does mean is that we need to be a little more humble about the quantitative statements that are made about any of these possible outcomes. We don't know what the probability is of a future pandemic. We know that it is likely at some point that there will be another one. And we know that climate change is developing. But the consequences of that, and are, you know, is it likely that we will be able to find a technological solution which will enable us maybe more easily than we think to capture carbon or to develop alternative sources of energy? All of these things are highly uncertain. And I don't think it makes sense just to attach numbers to it. What, one of the things that hasn't really received enough attention, I think, in the coronavirus example, is that the model predictions that are made by all the models, including the one in Imperial College, which is based on very good theoretical concepts about the way a virus develops and an epidemic spreads, is based on a number of parameters which are assumptions about which are made by the modelers, which do not correspond to known scientific facts. Mm. So how will we all respond to a lockdown? How will we respond to the lifting of various restrictions? These are not scientific facts. They're judgments that have to be made. And hence, I think the big lesson for government in all this is that governments cannot just delegate to scientists the judgment about what we must do. You can't say, ah, oh, because the scientists say the probability of the epidemic spreading is less now than so many percent, that we, it's now safe to lift restrictions. You're always balancing things which are very hard to quantify. That is the role of government. They have to make judgments and they should explain that more clearly, I think. There is a great temptation at present to say, oh, we will do what the science tells us we must do. But I'm afraid the science does not tell us what we must do. You draw in the book a distinction between judgment and opinion. Do you just want to touch on that in 30 seconds? John. I think that's one for you, Mervyn, but um, the governor of the Bank of England, I would say, but uh, I'll, I'll happily have a shot at answering it if you, if you like. Um, what we're talking about here is a good example of this, that uh, judgment is what experienced people who've been in this kind of situation before reckon as the best way of moving ahead. That's very different from opinion, and lots of people have opinions about coronavirus and a whole range of other things. Uh, the trouble is, there are not many people who have relevant knowledge and experience of handling this kind of situation. And one of the things in relation to all the issues we're talking about here, uh, whether it's climate change or coronavirus or other pandemics or other forms of radical uncertainty, is the importance of uh, the tacit knowledge of people who've seen situations that are not ex exactly like this. You can't construct a historical database uh, usefully of pandemics, but have seen situations a bit like this before and have ideas about the effectiveness of social distancing and the like. So you would, uh, one of the readers here is talking about uh, making sure, he used to work for an energy trader, Ricky Morrill, uh, who always kept the 73 and the 76 oil shocks in the risk models to assure that those extreme events were never forgotten. So interesting. Um, I'd just like to turn in the time available two more points. Uh, at one point in the book, um, you talk about uh, the importance of the scope of imagination, which certainly sounds very relevant when we're talking about uncertainties. What, what limits the scope of imagination? How do we overcome it? How do we improve our imagination? Uh, John, you talked at, uh, you know, quite a bit about uh, narrative and the, the idea of a reference narrative. Do you, want to, do you want to touch on that? And most of all, we take advantage of the huge collective knowledge that we have as a whole. 
Uh, people talk about the wisdom of crowds, but often in a rather silly way. It's the aggregate of information that is really valuable, not the average of information that is really valuable. And that's why people who good make good decision makers, who build robust and resilient reference narratives, are people who talk to a lot of other people about what it is they want to do and invite challenge to their views. I have to say, however, that my experience is that an awful lot of people have said to me in the course of my lifetime, we need someone like you to challenge our ideas. Only a small proportion of these people do. Yeah, certainly not what they want. It may be what they need. <laughs> yes. And uh, just to sort of move towards a, a bit of a close here, um, a lot of questions are, that I'm, I'm picking up here are related to um, how do we best embrace uncertainty? How do I, having read your book, I go, well, great, they're black swans, but I kind of knew <coughs> that. Um, I can see the limitations of the model. I'll be much more careful in using words like risk and volatility or, uh, you know, res resolvable and unresolvable. Oh, that's great. And it really, really is good. But what should my world outlook be? What should my viewpoint be having read the book? How do I live this life and, and not become too glum? Manage risk, which is about creating robust and resilient, realistic reference narratives. And once you've, once you've done that, you can start to embrace uncertainty and get the, the pleasure of meeting new things, uh, the joy of innovation and the like. Uh, so uncertainty within the context of secure reference narrative is something to enjoy and benefit from. We talk in the end about Denmark as the um, exemplar of a country that gives people a secure reference narrative. You know that nothing much will go wrong in your life if you live in a society like that. And that's what's enabled it actually to become a remarkably creative society in terms of innovation and now rather intriguingly uh, catering. If you want an interesting meal, you do better in Copenhagen nowadays Definitely. than you do in Paris. Also murder mysteries and things like that. So <laughs> it may be boring, but they like to spice it up a bit. <laughs> a bit like we in did, co comparison with of, the Borgias in Italy. Yes. In fact, they can have murder mysteries because there aren't actually very many murders. <laughs> then... We did think about whether we should finish the book with a list of sort of, you know, five lessons for how to cope with uncertainty. But we very quickly came to the viewpoint that the whole point of the book is that there are not, you know, seven lessons of how people manage it or 11 lessons to cope with the 21st century. That trying to translate a complex world into the simple rules for life is may sell lots of books, particularly in the United States, but it's actually a very misleading way. We face complex and difficult challenges, which as we stressed this morning are unique. They're one-off problems and we have to think our way through them. It's, it's living what we hope will be a good life, but doing it intelligently. And as John said, I think the, the essence is to try to identify in your own life, what the risks are, take steps to manage those risks and then be open to all kinds of other influences and experiences, which if we're lucky, will enable us to discover all the wonderful things out there that we were unaware of before. So you uh, live life to the full, really. <laughs> Seize yes. the day. And Even I, if you uh, experience Groundhog Day, you don't want to. No, well, you've certainly, <laughs> uh, you've uh, done the uncertainty about uncertainties and ensured that the you were unpredictable by not closing your book with uh, se seven key lessons or something, but thankfully so, I, I might add. I appreciated that. I find that pandering. And uh, just before I close, I wanted to give both of you uh, one opportunity to say, uh, I don't want to read a 544-page book. Who the heck does? But I know somebody who should. Uh, and who would you most like viewers to buy this book for? Well, first I should say that the font is a large font. It is pleasant to read. You haven't got to squint at the page because the pages are crammed with words. So it's, in terms of number of words in the book, it's not an, an especially long book. Um, 
And in terms of who you should buy it for, either you should buy it for all your friends, colleagues, and relatives. I can't leave anyone who would not benefit from reading it. Good. I have to agree with Mervyn on that, but, but I should say well, along the short of us on investment, the number of people have told me I bought copies from my nephews and nieces is actually enormous. I hope you can. <laughs> Well, John and Mervyn, it's been really, really fun. And uh, I've been told by the CISI that they might want a reprise and we could dive into some deeper areas. And readers, uh, sorry, listeners, it, it, they're absolutely correct. It is a very large font. Uh, so it's a, an eminently readable book. And I enjoyed it enormously. Uh, and, I, and I like to think I know a little bit about the field. Uh, in particular, uh, it was an extremely salutary reminder that models definitely, definitely have their limits. I've spent a lot of time on the distinction between uh, time averaging and models and uh, ensemble averaging and the many mistakes that people in financial services in particular make using an ensemble average, because as you point out, we really only live one life. And you had a beautiful example, uh, perhaps Mervyn or John, you might just like to share in closing the example of the guard in the revolution. Oh, this is, was the guard in the revolution who um, thought uh, it was used by GLS Shackle, actually, as an example of, of radical uncertainty. And he was decided, should, should he be loyal and protect the em empress or side with the rebels? And he said, if I protect the empress and the revolution fails, I will be a hero. If I don't and it succeeds, uh, I will be dead, but I will probably be dead anyway if the revolution succeeds. So I will protect the empress. Well, one of the things that, uh, you know, for me, uh, I, I might end with is a dear friend of mine, Mark Duff, uh, has a family motto uh, on his official crest, which reads, uh, Siepe erans nunquam dubia, often in error, never in doubt. And I, think, <laughs> and I think what is absolutely great about your book is you're pointing to us. We should, we should embrace doubt a lot more heartily. Anyway, uh, were there a live audience, I'd ask them to clap. Uh, so I'll have to do it myself. But Mervyn and John, thank you so much for a most informative hour. And I do hope that all of the listeners uh, do go out and buy a copy, if not for somebody else, for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you.